Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for another episode of Two Economists and a Lender, where we take a deep dive into the most important issues impacting agriculture today. I'm your host, Carly Jacobson. David Widmar and Brent Gloy are back with us from Agricultural Economic Insights, along with our lender expert, Aaron Luger, an officer from our Northeast Kansas region. Some of you may be familiar with net present value from courses you've taken or workshops you've participated in. But NPV calculation can very quickly become overwhelming when looked at solely as an academic calculation, but not today. In today's episode, David, Brent, and Aaron are going to approach NPV from a practical angle with strategies for using it in your decision making, including providing you with access to a spreadsheet to make this calculation easy to do, giving you more time to evaluate the data in your decision. So Brent, looking forward to diving in. Thank you, Carly. Uh Great to be back again this week, and this is a topic that I'm very excited about that made the list in uh, to a commerce and a lender. I've been pushing for this for a while, and um, I think uh, of all the things that you know, I used to teach as a professor, this is one of the concepts that I think is one of the most important ones to understand, and those are just principles of, you know, the time value of money, and, you know, I would like to start, you know, this, this is going to help us think about future earnings. And um, today, especially with a little bit higher rates of inflation, it's really important to, to realize that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. And just how much more uh, it's worth today than tomorrow is dependent on uh, all these concepts we're going to talk about today. And I think Albert Einstein, who everybody's familiar with, had a really famous quote where he said that compound interest is the most powerful force in the universe. And why did he say that? Because uh, it's really amazing what the power of time can do. Uh, and I think these principles are really important for most of the big financial decisions that we make in our lives. It's really important. Uh, if we were buying something like farmland, it's among the biggest investments that any of us will ever make in our lifetime and how we make those decisions and the quality of those decisions is going to go a long way toward determining um, how successful we are financially uh, in, in the future. And so those are some of the really important reasons why, you know, I think our long term success is determined by that time value money. Now, uh, the reason, you know, they think compound interest is important. You know, we all remember those exponential curves when we were looking at the, the virus uh, rates and how fast, you know, the number of infections would grow over time. And it's the same concept with money and a little bit of investment today turns out to be a lot in the future as that compound interest starts to add up. We tiled the session net present value investment analysis and uh, these are the kinds, so let's just set the stage a bit for these are situations where we're putting out a lot of money up front and it's going to generate cash flows for a long period of time. And I always tell people that uh, farmland is a great example. Uh, the, the earnings that we're getting on that farmland today aren't really what's going to make that a good investment or a bad investment. Those are pretty well known. It's what those future earnings are going to be and how much they're going to be worth that really determines you know, its success. And so net present value analysis is a way to do that. And really all it's doing, there's a lot of, you know, there can be a lot of math. And if I were teaching, you know, when I taught a course on this, I'd spend a whole semester going through kind of the nuances and the mathematics of all of this stuff. But at the end of the day, it's a really simple concept. And if you think about investment, what we want to do is we want to say, well, it costs, you know, thousand dollars today, and it's going to generate income in the future. And simply, we just add those incomes up. And but the only caveat we have is that those dollars in the future aren't worth the same as dollars today. So we just have to convert those dollars in the future to today's dollars. And then we just want to simply add them up. And if if they're positive, we get more in, more value in than we put out. We want to you know do that investment. If it's negative, that means we're not getting you know, all of that value that we're spending today. So that's really the net present value analysis and investment rule in a nutshell is we want to add up dollars. We just have to recognize that we have to convert those dollars to today's dollars. Imagine for a second that, you know, Brent and I had a, a bet and I lost this bet. And in the prize is a hundred dollars 
per year for 10 years. So it's kind of like a lottery, but it's $100 a year for 10 years. And the question that we want you to think about today is, what is the least amount of money that you personally would be willing to accept today to settle that bet up front? And I want you to write the number down. So get, take a quick sheet of paper and, and write down the number. So as you think about that, that's $100 a year for 10 years. So, you know, how, how much of that thousand dollars a discount would you be willing to take you know there's a lot of reasons why you know we might be willing to accept the less than a thousand because that thousand dollars is the sum of those 10 years of a hundred dollars i mean david i might look at it and go well you know david's prospects uh you know maybe maybe he won't uh pay me back you know i might not even be able to find him in 10 years from now and I don't know where that check will come in. So I might be willing to take less. There's risk, in other words. There's also the fact that if I have that money today, a prepayment on it today, I can invest that money. So if I take that, you know, if he gives me $750, I can invest that, say, in the stock market or in my business or whatever, and earn money on it all the way through instead of waiting for those $100. Now, as we see the results, I see that uh, about a quarter or say, hey, you know, no discount. I want a thousand bucks. I won't take anything less. Otherwise, I'm making pay me a hundred dollars for uh, every year. Those people trust David a lot. <laughs> um, and then there's a big group at that $750 to $999. And I'd probably be in that category. Uh, quite a few more in that 500 and a few less than 500 and say, hey, you know what? Uh, you give me less than 500, I'll take it. You know, I get $400, I'll take it today. Why might they do that? Well, they might have a big demand for that money today as opposed to in the future. So I want you to keep this in the back of your mind because we're going to revisit this in a part of an example because we're going to show you how this plays out when you actually pull out of the spreadsheet and you start plugging in some of these variables and you start actually thinking about what is my discount rate? And we're going to define that here in the next slide. So there are uh, four steps that are really important for you to really think about this time value of money and the discounted cash flow analysis. And the first one is you need to estimate those cash flows. And in the example we just talked about, that was you know the description of $100 per year for 10 years. So you really need to think about what's going to happen in each year of this investment that I'm analyzing. The second piece that we're going to do is we're going to take a discount rate and we're going to discount those future earnings to today's dollars. The third step here is you want to compare the discounted in cash inflows and the outflows. And then we're going to uh, perform some sensitivity analysis uh, to really think about the, the range and how much those those outcomes, how sensitive the outcome is between maybe option A and option B is a, a few tweaks in the adjustments or the substance. So Brent, I'll set this up and then you're going to jump in and help us walk through it. So what we did here at the top is we started with a discount rate. And the discount rate we assumed here was 5%. Uh, I happen to know Brent's discount rate. He throws it out a lot. You know, to economists, he always throws out all oh, my discount rate on this would be 5%. So I'm going to try to figure out how to get Brent to negotiate. I'm going to try to use this tool to negotiate against Brent. So I know his discount rate is 5% or I think it'll be 5% in that ballpark. And then as you can see at the top, I map out all 10 years of this investment. So we start with each year, 2021, all the way to 2030. And then we actually think about when those payments are going to be made, how many years in the future. So I got to make him a payment today and I got to make him a payment a year from now. And we keep working that out. So then the next line here, are, these are the specific payment schedule. This is $100 owed every single year, 10 of those in total. So that gets me to that, that $1,000. And then what we do in the next line is we discount the present value of those future payments. And so Brent, I'm going to let you jump in here. I want to let you yeah. help us think about what it means to have a discounted uh, cash flow and what it and implications for today. Right. And so the very first thing to say is, well, look, after year one, uh, if I, if you gave me a hundred dollars today and I could invest it at 5%, uh, I could, I would be willing to accept $95. So in other words, if I took $95 and 24 cents and invested it at 5%, that would get me to a hundred dollars. So in other words, that hundred dollars, uh, a year in the future is the equivalent of having $95 today. If you go to year two, it only takes $90 because I get to invest that $100 
for two years. So I only need $90 in year two, or in other words, $100 two years from now is only worth $90 to me. And you can see by the time you get out here to year nine, it's only $64 of value. So if I put $64 in an investment that earns me 5% a year in year nine, I would have $100. So I ought to be willing to take $64 today. Now, what I didn't tell David is that uh, I'm glad he's using a 5% discount rate because I would probably use a little bit higher discount rate uh, than 5%, maybe more like eight, which means these future numbers would all be smaller than that. So in other words, if you're investing that $64 at 8%, it, it, you would have way more than $100 nine years from now. So I would actually like it that he offered me $800 and I would take that in, in a heartbeat um, if he were giving me $800 today as opposed to $100 a year for uh, 10 years. So let's talk about this discount rate, Brent, that you mentioned. So I showed some extreme um, outcomes here. So we talked about 5% discount right there in the middle, 811 in net present value. When you add up all those future discounted cash flows, it comes to $811 rounded. If I could convince Brent to go below, lower than, you know, 5%, get closer to that 1% discount rate that if I, I don't, I don't want that to happen, right? I guess I don't want that to happen. If, if, if he really wants to, you know, get this price higher, he's going to be wanting to accept a higher, um, a higher net present value with a lower discount rate. And on the other hand, if he has a higher discount rate, it's going to make those payments even lower. So that's what Brent was talking about earlier. If he had an 8% discount rate, he would actually be willing to accept a lower offer today. And so my $810 bid would be very, very attractive. And this is where it gets really important in the context of something like farmland, which we're going to show you an example on really soon. If I want a 10% return, and let's say that I had a farm piece of farmland that generate $100 a year for 10 years, how much would you be willing to pay for it? If I want a 10% return, I could only pay $676 for that farmland. If I'm willing to take a 1% return, I would bid almost $957 an acre for that farmland. So that's where we say when that discount rate, when interest rates get low, what does it do to asset values? It pushes them up. There's a lot of different things we can do with present value, though. And one of the other ones that almost all of us face is a simple act of refinancing a mortgage. So let's say today we had borrowed money for 10 years at 4.25%. And your financial service officer comes to you with two options. He says, Brent, we will refinance for you that 10-year note, and we're going to do it at 3%. But in order to do it, you're going to have to have some fees associated with that. Maybe you have to have it appraised or, or whatever. Uh, and it's going to cost $2,500. Or you can borrow that money for five years, and we're going to do it even lower interest rate. 2.2%. But again, it's going to cost you $2,500. The question is, which of these options is the best? Do we stick at 10? I mean, $2,500 seems like a lot of money. Is that is it worth it to get that lower interest rate? And do we do it for 10 years or five years? And let's see what we can see when we put that into a net present value framework. So here, what we've done is we said, again, we used a 5% discount rate. So that's the rate that we expect to earn. Uh, we borrowed that $200,000. That's our status quo. If we refinance uh, that note and we cut it down here, it's going to cost us $2,500 today. Uh, we're going to get some savings. So our current payments are right short of $25,000 a year. If we refinance, we're at 23400 So a lot of us would just simply sit there and go, well, look, uh, we're going to save about $1,500. So after two years, roughly, we're going to have that $2,500 back. It's going to take us about two years to get it back. Uh, that seems like a decent deal, so we'd probably take it. But with net present value, now we can look at option two, which also says, hey, it's $2,500. Uh, but now my payments are going to go up a lot, 42,000, but my payments in, you know, years, the out years are zero. So now how do we compare it? And we can do that with the discounted cash flow, And then we add those payments up, the discounted payments up, and we can see 
The option two has a positive net present value of 16,000. Option three has a positive net present value of 12,000. So of these three options, if our rate of return is 5%, we would wanna take option one. Uh, but if we, if we didn't have option one, we'd also like option two because that's even better than our current situation, which had a $7,000 net present value. So a lot of things will influence the attractiveness. We have a much higher rate of return. Uh, we'll want to probably uh, go, go again to option one because it require, doesn't require us to pay back as fast. If we have really low discount rates, we're going to want to go to option two. I think, you know, this is just a, an example to help you think about how your preferences of, you know, how you value the time, how you think about the time value of money. Do you want to pay this off earlier or, you know, how do you value those future payments? That's what we're trying to think about here. And this is just an example to help you think about it. And as you can imagine, right, there's a whole lot of information that goes into this much more than what, you know, the local car dealer might give you if they're trying to sell you a car based on payments. There's a lot of information you have to collect to make this come together. The final example we want to show here, and I'll set this up and Brent, you can jump in, is this idea of, you know, buying an acre of farmland and farmland has a really long payment stream. And this is kind of this extreme case of how time value money comes in. So the purchase price we've put there is uh, $7,000. And as you can see, the net rent, so rent less property taxes is $235 an acre. And what you want to avoid, and we assumed a holding period, or we assumed, you know, we're going to look 40 years in the future. What we want to avoid is just simply adding up all of those rental payments. So if you do that, you're going to get all the way to the bottom there. You want to avoid that. That's not a good way of considering this investment analysis. So what we did in the column right next to it is we looked at, okay, let's discount those future payments at a rate of 5%. And as you can see, they start to eat away and, and chip down. And so that payment in year you know, 35 to year 40, the time value of money at a 5% discount rate says those payments today are worth you know, $33 at 40 years and $43 at uh, 35 years. Again, the, all, the idea here is the alternative is you take you know, that money and you put it into an investment that earns 5%, you would need $33 today to have $234 40 years from now. What we really want to focus on here is look at what happens if you lower that discount rate to 1.5%. Same sort of investment flow, but the discount rate starts to have a, a really big impact as to how it values those payments way out in the future. So $130 in present value terms for 40 years versus 33 with the 5% discount rate. And so you can start to see that net present value analysis, you know, it's positive. So this would be a good investment for you if you had a really low discount rate. If you had a 5% discount rate, you might say, you know, I could do something else with my money and I could get that 5% return that I was looking for in that discount rate. Yeah, so this is just a illustrative of how important those low interest rates are in something like farmland. And think about that. If we have a zero, interest rate. We don't expect, you know, we say, well, we can't get any kind of return on that money today. Uh, we just add that up and you get $9,400. Well, if we put it in at, at uh, uh, one and a half percent, it's really generating almost $7,000, a little over $7,000 present value. So in other words, we're not discounting those future earnings very much at all. And of course, if you're doing farmland, you'd want to do a little bit more sophisticated analysis than this, but this is this general concept and it helps you understand just how important these low, low interest rates are on something that has a long life like farmland. So the difference here is a hundred dollars of value in that payment going from one and a half or from 5% down to one and a half percent, which doesn't really seem like that much. I mean, I think to most people, but at the end of the day, that's a huge impact. So Brent, we're going to share the Excel file that we'll share a link. So you can download that Excel file that we put together for this. Again, this is an educational tool for you to sort of look at. You can play with, you can see how changing those discount rates plays out. So to wrap this up, before we bring in our lender expert this month, I want to share a few examples of where this calculation might be valuable. We've talked about farmland. We talked about this financing options. We've already covered those. In an earlier episode, we did machinery lease versus own. This is an example where you could think about net present value between a lease versus own option. Grain bins is another example where net present value can be valuable. You have this investment up front, and then you try to return 
uh, get some returns to storage out into the future. We sometimes see with livestock. So, you know, the cow herd, the individual cows, but also maybe in a contract livestock facility, you know, you're making a big investment and you're going to recover that over, you know, a 10 or 15 year contract. And finally, irrigation and drainage investments are another example. At the end of the day, net present value is really helpful when the cash flows that you're considering span over several years into the future. And that's really what we want to you know, drive home is how are you thinking about those future earnings and how do you pencil that into your assumption? So at this point, we're going to switch over to the lender conversation. So Aaron, thanks again for joining us. Thanks for helping us prepare for this as well. Um, to kick it off, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Thanks for having me, David and Brent. So I would be in Northeast Kansas. I would be our young beginning relationship officer working with a select young and beginning customer base in our region. Been with the company for eight years. And I also farm with my parents and one brother in, around the Seneca area. Well, I want to spend this time with you to really help us um, dive into some of those assumptions or those estimates that producers use when they're using their investment analysis. But before we get to that, I want to ask you a little bit about how you typically see producers uh, thinking about those big investment decisions that, that they have to make. What I would say is typically most of the operations that we see, I'll explain it in an example like this, is if they're looking at making a sprayer uh, purchase, a lot of times they will just compare what is their loan payment going to be versus what has their application cost been historically. And they'll look at, at a very simple mathematical equation like that. But intuitively, to some extent, they're using that discounted cash flow because that loan payment is based on the same concept. So it's amortizing the cost of that sprayer over um, a long period of time. Of course, where you can get yourself into trouble is if you maybe you put a whole bunch of money down on that sprayer. You you know, if you just look at the loan payments, it 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 could give you a little bit of a misleading result. And to add to that, right? Sometimes the sprayer isn't the only consideration, right? We still have water that we have to put into it. We might have to have nurse tanks and trailers and all this other element. So that's can be where, you know, mapping out those future cash inflows and outflows can be really valuable to understand what that, what that payment life looks like. And is it a, wor- a good worthwhile investment here today? In preparing for uh, this, you stress the importance of having a good set of estimates for evaluating the farm decision. So can you elaborate a little bit on some of the best practices you've seen for producers who are trying to map out all of the assumptions that go into making a good investment? Yeah, so what I'd say is probably the best operation or one of the better operations that I've worked with, they went in and put robots, three robotic milkers in, um, oh, probably about three or four years ago at a fairly sizable investment. I want to say it was somewhere around three quarters of a million to $800,000 initial investment. And how they back calculate into, is that a good investment for our operation or not, is obviously they use some of the industry and manufacturer information as far as what their returns would be. But then they also went and discounted some of those returns like we talked about earlier just to do a little bit of stress testing on those. They also made sure for their operation, they wanted to have over a 10% return. Otherwise they felt like it wasn't worth that, but every operation is going to have a different number, but they made sure to use the industry or manufacture information on robotic milkers. They discounted it themselves. And then they also wanted to make sure that they showed a return on the money that they were investing. Yeah. And that's really great. That's, and, and that's a super, it's really an appropriate type of project to analyze. This is a lot of money up front and, and it's going to last for a long period of time. And you really got to sit back and say, what are those cash flows uh, that are going to come in as a result of that investment, you know, outflow and as well as inflow. And then, um, you know, how likely are they to come in and then what kind of return do we really want? And, and, uh, you know, getting 10% return uh, seems reasonable. And of course, if they need to make that decision in the future, right? Do they expand the operation or add more robotic milkers? 
they can go back to those notes that they had three or four years ago and they can say, hey, this were the, these were the assumptions we used. Um, how did that work out? And they can use those assumptions. They can update them with their own data uh, and they can start to look at that again so they can help them scale that if that's yep. of, uh, of interest. David, that's what they're doing right now is they're adding another two. They're going to shut down their parlor completely because like you just said, they now historically have their own numbers on those first three it's an easy decision for them to make. Yeah. Now they have much better data to make that decision. So I want to talk a little bit about grain bins. You had a little story about grain bins and I think it's really relevant to this investment decision. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what's going on in the grain bin markets? Yeah. So we had an officer that was talking with a customer about grain bins here this fall or uh, the customer was getting bids on them and they compared the same bid or the same grain bin over the course of the last year, they received a bid on that bin in the fall of 2020, and that bin was 83,000 turnkey project. And they received the same bid for that bin here in the fall of 21, and that grain bin was going to cost them 162,000. Whoa. So going back to what you talked about in the webinar uh, here, David, about grain bins having kind of that set return that you're shooting for the life that becomes a lot harder to achieve that when essentially your asset has doubled, but your turns are probably going to be, you're hopefully hoping the same. Yeah. It makes a huge difference, doesn't it? And, and so either those returns have got to grow or maybe they were positive enough the last time, but they probably would have built it last time if they were that positive. So, um, it really helps you think through, you know, whether, you know, everybody, I think this year's got challenges with maybe, you know, tax issues that they haven't had for a while. And so people are starting to look at things, but it really makes you question, you know, what kind of return am I accepting on an investment like that? So Aaron, I got one last question for you. And then again, we'll, we'll see you in the overtime. Um, the question I want to ask you is to, I guess you shared an example about how, you think about this for your own situation with hauling grain. So can you set it up a little bit and tell us how you think about this decision of, you know, using your own assets to haul grain and how there's, you have an alternative and how you're evaluating that? Yeah, I certainly can. So this, this would be a personal example. Like David said, our operation, we figure that for us to haul grain ourselves, it's probably going to cost us somewhere in that 10 to 12 cents bushel range. However, my brother and I both work off farm. So for us, we have to start calculating in what's our vacation time worth to us? Where do we need to be spending that? Also, at the same point in time, if we get stopped at the end user, maybe we only get one load a day in because we're having to wait in line all day. What's that value to us? So when we go and look at that, our we're able to get our grain custom hauled for about 25 to 27 cents per bushel. For a lot of operations, they would say, hey, that's great. I'll pocket that difference. But for us, when we start calculating in our vacation time, where do we need to spend that? Even if we do take vacation, how much are we truly accomplishing? For us, it's not... It's not as big of a difference for others to where we just say, come get it. You guys haul it. We'll just load you up and go from there. And I think what's great about that example is um, you've thought about it today. And in the future, when conditions change, you can revisit that. And maybe in the future, you, you're not as putting as much weight on this, this odd farm job. Maybe you're full time or maybe you're uh, looking to make an investment in a new piece of machinery. You have some additional labor. You can revalue, reevaluate those assumptions. So thank you so much, Aaron, for your time and helping us prepare and for sticking around for the Q&A here in a few minutes. So thanks for sticking around. And we've got some good questions in here. And, and if you have any others, drop them in the chat or put them in the Q&A bubble uh, and, and we'll get them answered. And the first question that came up is one that I, I taught I taught this stuff for years. And uh, when you go to implement it, the hardest thing I always found um, was what is the appropriate discount rate that we should use? And 
um, or, you know, I think when we teach it at the university, we just kind of say, well, assume a 10% discount rate or assume a, you know, it was always in the assume category. It wasn't in the figure out what your discount rate is. And the way I always answer that is there, there are a couple of things we know. And, and the first thing is that the discount rate has to be higher than the cost of, of that you're borrowing at. So when you think about a business, there's two types of capital in the business. There's equity capital, that's the money we put in, and there's debt capital, the money the lender puts in. The money we pay the lender has to be paid, right? So his capital is in some sense, or her capital is somewhat sense less risky than our equity capital. We get what's left over and that has risk. So we have to earn a higher rate of return on the stuff that we're putting in than what we're paying the lenders. So your discount rate has to be bigger than uh, whatever your average cost of borrowed funds are. The question then becomes how much bigger? And what I like to say is, well, what is a reasonable rate of return over a long period of time? And if you look at kind of, well, I could put money in the stock market, I could put money in bonds, I could put money in farmland, all these other things, what's a reasonable rate of return? And I usually use something personally around 8%. Now you can say, well, the geez, Brent, that's pretty low. I would, I, don't you want to earn more in your business than 8%? And the answer is yes, I do. But if I set that discount rate really high, like, oh, I want to earn 15%. Okay. That would be nice. But if I set it that high, I'm not going to do very many things because there just aren't that many things that are going to earn you 15% on a big scale over a long period of time. So I usually use somewhere around that 8%. And I think of that as kind of a risk-free long-term rate of government bonds, maybe 3% and then 5% for the risk we're taking. So that's right now, that's what I'd use. And that's why I would have took David's offer when he offered me it at 5%. I would say, absolutely. I'll take your, that's more. I would have, I would have probably taken eight but uh, usually he gets me in those questions. I think it's worthwhile to mention, Brent, that um, every individual looking at the same opportunity might take a different discount rate into that. And also you might evaluate different alternatives with a different discount rate. You might say, if I wanna do this, it's, I need a bigger rate because of the risks or the requirements that it just, I perceive that I'm gonna have to do into that. One thing I would suggest you to do is to think about back to that first example we had, what was the discount rate that was implied based on what you said you were willing to accept? So you can open that Excel sheet up and you can sort of think, play with it a little bit and say, okay, what, what discount rate do I have to plug in here to get something in the ballpark of what I said was the dollar amount I'd be willing to take away? So you can kind of think about to yourself, what is the discount rate that I have been accepting? And that could be a good way for you to start to think about what is one that you want to accept in the future. Right. And, and I think when you go to like a farmland sale, one of the things David always reminds me, I come back and say, well, I just sold way too high. I can't see how that would work. He said, well, maybe somebody who's willing to accept a lower rate of return than you were. And I think that's usually the case. Um, sometimes it might be they have a very different view of what the cash flows are, because that's the other hard part of this analysis. We just wrote down 40 years of returns for farmland. Well, you should not do that. You, you have to think about what is a long-term sustainable return on that farm and what's going to go into that and, and really think about it. And it's not so much about, I think, the number that you get out of these analyses. And I think uh, it's more about the process of building it and the process of thinking about what, you know, might come in, what kind of return is that that I'm getting? And, and that, that, that process is as important as anything. Now, something like a refinancing alternative that we showed you, that's pretty certain because we know we're going to make those payments uh, at least we probably wouldn't borrow the money if we didn't think we were going to be able to make those payments. Our loan officer wouldn't have lent us the money if they didn't think we were going to make those payments. So we can we can plug those numbers in with a lot more certainty and see uh, you know what is a better alternative. And and this kind of analysis lets you look at those things that have different lives, and and that's a really big uh, benefit. Another question: What are some other other investments? other than farmland that would, where you would take maybe a lower discount rate. Um, 
and I think these are situations where um, the 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 risk is low, and and that refinancing situation is one that I can think of right off the top of my head where I go, well, you know, I might put a lower discount rate on that, uh, especially if I'm comparing um, similar term structures because uh, I've got I'm kind of committed to similar cash flows for a long period of time. It's twenty five hundred dollars isn't that much to extra to put up. So the fees are usually pretty small. So I might use a lower discount rate than I would on something like farmland. Um, but again, it, it kind of comes back to what's the risk uh, associated with, with the investment you're considering. Equipment, on the other hand, I would normally think of as a higher discount rate because there's a lot of uncertainty over you know, what the residual value is going to be um, and even the benefits of it. I think one example we see a lot of times is people put their money in the bank in the savings account. They're accepting a pretty small discount rate, right? They're they're thinking about that in, in this this context. So that's I guess an example from the outside of ag. I'm seeing a question about on something like farmland. Uh, how would you go about estimating those future returns? And I think that that is a really good question uh, and a really hard question to answer. And I like to think of it a couple ways. One, I like to think of it and say, well, today, uh, if, if farmland costs $9,000 an acre, let's just throw out a number, um, what kind of uh, annual payment would it take for me to say, hey, that's a good deal? And I can use my time value money concepts to generate that just like your lender kind of magically pushes that in his financial calculator or her financial calculator and says, well, if you borrow, you know, $9,000 for 20 years, here's what the payments look like. You can do that uh, uh, for that. And then you can kind of back into say, well, does that, you know, does that seem realistic, reasonable, et cetera, et cetera. I just want to go on the record and say that two economists and a lender talked about net present value and we did it in 30 minutes. Like this is kind of a world speed record. I think we should, should get uh, Guinness world records on the, on the line for this one. Yeah. Well, we have to, we have to kind of, you know, we, we obviously can't teach you all these mathematics of this in, in 20 minutes. Um, But we can certainly encourage you. Uh, to go seek out more resources, because I said, this is one of the most important concepts I think we can, we can all know. And, you know, it's just like with young people and your kids, one of the things that they have the benefit of, and I tell young farmers this all the time, I mean, you, you're a huge advantage relative to me because you've got one of the most important things on your side, and that's time. And time is super powerful when it comes to things like compound interest, because it really snowballs up. And so making those investments early and, you know, if you have employees and you offer them a retirement plan, explain to them, you know, the benefits of putting that money away early is just, it's really hard to understate the value of that. So maybe one question I'll ask Brent and David for you guys is, a lot of times we'll get questions as financial officers or financial services officers around, well, we don't see land. We're not making any more of it. Prices just continue to grow up or continue going up. Is there any calculations as far as if we're talking about land, the appreciation value that we need to take into consideration on these calculations? Yeah. And, and, a lot of times when, when you teach this at the university, we spend a lot, I mean, I'd spend a week talking about how to estimate what we call the terminal value or the ending value of that farm. And, uh, but the reality is, is that if you put run numbers out for something like 40 years, that ending value doesn't have nearly as much I- impact on the decision, but I like to put that in there and discount it. And then you can always do sensitivity on it. Um, the other thing I think, it's important to kind of at least, I don't want to say push back, but at least challenge people to think about that assumption that it won't go down. Um, I don't know about the rest of the trade territory, but um, I could, you know, people could have probably bought land for 60, 70% of what they're paying for it today, a year ago or 18 months ago. I know you could have. 
So it's appreciated significantly in that period of time. That it will not continue to appreciate at that rate, I'm certain. And um, you know, even though the Earth isn't getting bigger, um, there's more land being brought into production all the time in other places, and that land is becoming more productive over time. So um, I think the scarcity principle sometimes needs to be uh, pushed back a little bit on. There's a lot of land, uh, a lot of land for sale. And there always is, you know, anywhere from 1% studies out of Iowa State have shown from, you know, 1% to 2.5% of it changes hands about every year. Um, so, you know, I, I, I like to kind of at least challenge people to say, you know, that assumption is not always valid. But what I will say about farmland in particular, since we're kind of the lane we've veered into, is the way I look at it is that if you think about a continuum of 100%, about 5% of the time, you're going to buy farmland at a price so cheap it's going to earn a phenomenal rate of return. It's going to be a phenomenally good investment. It doesn't matter how good a farmer you are or anything. You bought it cheap enough that it's going to be really fabulously profitable. About five to 10% of the time, you're going to buy it at such a high price that uh, it's going to take 40 years for that to turn out to be a good investment. Maybe, maybe not 40, maybe 25 or 30 years. Um, the rest of the time you're buying it at a price that's usually going to provide you an adequate and, and reasonable rate of return, somewhere around seven to 10% uh, compounded annual return, which is very good. And uh, so our challenge is to avoid that 5% or 10% of the time when it's just too high priced and focus our efforts when it gets closer to, you know, what seems to be a, a really good opportunity. And those really good opportunities don't come around very often. Uh, most of the time you're, you pay a pretty fair price for it. I don't know if I answered your question, but I talked for a long time. No, you did. I just, I just wanted to make sure that our attendees uh, heard that from you because that's something that will certainly go through their head as they're making uh, purchasing decisions. You know, I've thought about this a lot recently. I've been wanting to buy farmland myself and uh, you know, it's funny because to me, land always feels expensive. It feels expensive when it's really cheap because nobody else wants to buy it. And then you're worried that you're the one out on the island paying way too much for it. And it feels like really expensive to me when everybody else wants it. And, but you want it then too. And it's kind of like uh, if you have a stock portfolio or anything, I find myself much more willing to open it up and look and see what the values are when they're going up all the time than I do when it's going down. And uh, it's just a human, um, we're wired a little bit backwards. We want to buy when everybody else buys and we want to, you know, avoid it when nobody else wants it. And really from a financial standpoint, we should do the opposite. So that'll do it for another episode of Two Economists and a Lender. Thank you, David, Brent, and Aaron for leading today's conversation. And for you in the audience, thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you online again next month.